it's really a book that um, could be a model for what uh, communities could look like in youth sports. And just, just to sort of set the scene a little bit, Norwich, Vermont is a small town of about 3,000 people. They've put an athlete on almost every US Winter Olympics team and has won three medals. So to put that in perspective, uh, Spain has 46 million people and they've won uh, two Winter Olympic medals since 1936. Uh, New Zealand has 4.7 million people. They have won uh, two Winter Olympics medals. So Karen, this is a town of 3,000 people. Yep. They've produced 11 Olympians dating back over several decades, won three medals. What is going on in Norwich, Vermont? It's some powerful maple syrup, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, it was really interesting because I had never stepped foot in Vermont before I went to research um, for this book. And what I found is that obviously Vermont is, it's quirky, it revels in its independence. And um, so the athletes I came upon are for the most part not, I didn't find a figure skater in the bunch. It's ski jumpers and mogul skiers. and. Um, so they're not attracted to those sports to get rich. So they are maybe going to these sports with a pure um, purpose to begin with. But what I also found very quickly is that um, in, in this town and in Vermont in general, they sort of raise their children the way they once did their, um, the farmers did their cattle and whatnot organically, no supersizing, no genetically modifying to try to get better, bigger results. So it, was, it really started out as a sports book and became more of a parenting guide because as I've sat here today listening to all these terrific panels, what has really struck me is that this town really is the paradigm of the project play um, embodiment, you know, Many of the kids, almost every one of the kids plays sports at some time because they actually still have a recreation department and it's a no cut recreation department. So anything that you do, you are guaranteed uh, participation in. Most of the kids do return year after year and um, they try many sports. In fact, of the 11 Olympians, the 10 of them changed sports with the season in high school. One of the Olympians played four sports. So they really have not, um, they've been able to stiff arm this whole professionalization model that is driving parents elsewhere insane. So did, I want to touch, touch on that a little bit more, on that model, the professionalization. And, and you write that they haven't caught up and gone on stayed up to date with the arms races. They're not involved yeah. in that with academics and with sports. Is that something they chose to do? And, and, and also, how do they maintain it you know, as, as they continue on over these uh, several decades? So we talk about modeling, and it starts with the parents. Many of these parents, um, they, they forsook um, high-powered careers in urban centers when they had children because they wanted to give their children the childhoods that they had. So they were looking for a more rural place to raise their children. So they're in some ways self-selecting because they're choosing an area. Norwich is across the Connecticut River from Dartmouth, but it is 90 minutes from the nearest airport where you can get you know decent connections. It's two hours from Boston. It's, I think, um, nearly five hours to New York. So you have to be willing to be a little farther afield from um, where all the quote unquote action is. But I also think that all the parents I came across, they model for their children the behavior that they hope to instill in their children. They all are very active. They exercise for the sake of exercising, not for any other reason, not for competitive purposes, but just because they see the mental benefits or they want to commune with nature. And they also highly value education, highly value community. It was such a joy. I actually moved to this um, town for six months. And it was such a joy to see the communitarian spirit 
um, I have spent 30 years covering um, sports, and too often I feel disheartened by the and the zero-sum game that sports have become, even with parents, like my child, if my child prospers, your child doesn't. You know, my child wins at the expense of your child. So it creates this cutthroat competitive atmosphere. Norwich has managed to avoid that. In fact, when I was researching the book, I remember being in an exercise class and these ladies came up to me afterward and said, are you the lady writing the book? Well, you need to talk to Edie because her son is an aspiring Olympian in the moguls. So here were other parents touting someone else's child and that was very, um, s s em that embodied what I found in Norwich. Um, not only has Norwich produced or put one of its residents on every U.S. Winter Olympic team except for one since 1984, it has put two summer Olympians on teams, including an 800-meter runner. And it was so funny. I was talking to one of the ski jumpers, and he said, yeah, you know, being the best ski jumper in America is like being the tallest midget, but in <laughs> everybody runs, so for Andrew Weeding to make the Olympic team, that's really a something. You really need to talk to him, and he told me something that has stuck with me. He told me this very early before I could really appreciate it, but he said, you know, in a lot of towns, it's sort of their Darwinian way of life that the strongest survive, but here it's the survival of all of us. And I really don't think that you can overstate the communitarian spirit and the one for all, all for one, that um, community uh, that really propels this city or this town its success. There are some great anecdotes you have in this book of an Olympian. My favorite is Hannah Kearney. Hannah is a, was an Olympic medalist, a gold medalist, mogul skier. She won gold in 2010. Um, she goes back to Sochi trying to repeat in 2014. She falters just a little bit, and she ends up winning the bronze, and then she's crushed. She, she, yes. She's in tears. She tweets. Um, she describes a, 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 the bronze as a, it's like a broken heart. And the town of Norwich, when she won the gold medal in 2010, they threw this great victory parade, kind of like how I pictured the ticker tape parades in New York City when, um, when champions in the 30s and 40s would return home. So they did this on a much smaller scale for Hannah. So in 2014, when these townspeople read this post and could see how heartbroken she was, they just very organically said, we cannot let her feel this way. We have to do something. And so they rallied and in a matter of days put together this homecoming parade for Hannah. So here she comes home and thinks she's the biggest failure because third place is the second loser. That's her, her perfectionist mentality. Um, but they hold this parade and make her feel in no uncertain terms that they could not be more proud of her. And she told me that by the end of it, what might have devastated her for months or years, and boy, this is really a window into that elite athlete psyche, that you would be devastated by a bronze medal for months or years, she said it only took her, you know, a days or weeks to get over, and that she owed that to Norwich, that Norwich was almost there as her collective therapy, you know, when she was, when she was having trouble um, really put, framing her performance in a healthy light, they would try to do that for her. And, and share a little bit about the, the third grade teacher at the yes. parade who shows up. Hannah's, you know, devastated. And what did she keep all these years? So Hannah, in third grade, they had had a needlepoint project. And so this third grade teacher had saved Hannah's needlepoint project for all these years. 
and thought that this was the perfect time to present her with it. So she had her come back to the third grade classroom, um, a classroom where, by the way, Hannah in third grade had burst into tears when she found out that she was going to have to share a desk because she thought that she was now a big girl who should get her own desk. I mean, this is how this um, woman is wired. But gave, presented her with this needlepoint that said, Home Sweet Home. And Hannah said, when she received this gift, she had two thoughts. Like, only in Norwich would a third grade teacher save this child's project for all these years. And then her second thought was, but how terrific that I live in this place where this teacher did. Yeah. It's worth noting also the demographics yeah. of Norwich. It's uh, mostly white. It's yep. uh, middle class to upper middle class. Median yep. household income is $89,000. So how can that model, you know, community support, um, sports isn't your only ticket. You have another right. identity. Um, the uh, collaboration among the people in the community, how can that model be transported to other demographics, if, if you think it can? Yeah, I think they have such a humanistic approach to raising their children and a holistic approach, and I think that transcends any kind of demographic because I am always puzzled, um, and as someone who grew up as an athlete and then I've been around athletics my entire adult life, I'm just baffled by this notion that... Um, Parents invest so much in their children as if sports is their golden ticket, their meal ticket to a better life, when really if you look at all of the percentages that we've seen today where less than 1% of the kids who play sports in high school go on to play in college and then pro it gets whittled down even more, really education is your golden ticket. And because of this demographic, they clearly understand that. But Hannah is a great portal to show how the generosity of this community is also something worth replicating. Um, she reached a certain point where she was going to have to start traveling nationally, and her parents sat her down and said, we cannot afford for you to, we just can't afford to send you to competitions where you have to travel by plane and stay in hotels, so you're going to have to figure this out. So she drew up, a, she must have been 12 or 13 at the time, she drew up a little resume and got on her bike and went to area businesses and got a little bit of support that way. And then there was the father of a man in town who became her anonymous benefactor. She never met this man, and he supported her gave her the bulk of her financial support until she made the national team. And he asked for two things in return, such gifts when you hear what I'm going to tell you. He said, I want you to give me a budget for how you spend every dollar of the money that I give you. So here, at an age when a lot of kids don't really appreciate the value of a dollar, Hannah had to figure out she, exactly how much money she was spending for each trip, how the breakdown of how much does a plane ticket cost, how much does it cost to eat for a day, um, how, much, how can I get the best hotel rate. So she was doing this all herself. Her parents were not doing this. Hannah was doing this. And then the second thing he asked for was her report card. So... He didn't care how she performed in her sport. He wanted to see what kind of grades she maintained. And so he, she told me that without even realizing at the time, he was giving her such a valuable gift, not only of the money, but of time, of management of money, and also making her understand at such a young age that academics was the priority. As much as she thought that sports was her world, he was m reminding her academics is what is going to carry you far. You've covered a lot of Olympians, you know, as, as a reporter. I wonder, is there a big difference between the Olympians you deal with who from Norwich mm. and the other U.S. Olympians? I was really struck by how they, how well they've been able to segue into their post-sports lives. 
Um, I would say that of the Olympians that I've covered and of the Olympians that I grew up with, that I swam with in college, um, well over 50% have dealt with major depression, um, a lot of mental health issues once they retire from their sports because it has been their self-identity. And they don't really grasp, well, if I have all of these life skills I've developed, they're easily translatable into other areas. The time management, the self-discipline, all of the, the delayed gratification, all of these things you're learning um, without even thinking about it as you pursue your sports goals are hugely impactful in the next area of your life. But they don't see that, so I cannot really overstate how many lost souls I've seen. And I'm talking about some of the most successful athletes that um, you know, you've heard of. So because these people have been developed um, holistically, they, their self-identities were never all about their sport. Even for someone like Hannah, who saw herself largely as a mogul skier, the townspeople were there always to say, no, Hannah, we see you as a great representative of the community. You're, we see you as someone who is very much a part of our fabric of the community. So they were always letting her know that she was so much more than a mogul skier. And I think that tie to the community is just really their salvation. Um, the two ski jumpers that are probably the best ski jumpers that America has ever produced, Jeff Hastings and Mike Holland, you can find them during the ski jumping high school season at Hanover High. One of them will be grooming the hill. The other will be on the PA system doing the announcing. These guys are the Michael Phelps and Ryan Lochte of their sport, and here they are three decades later, just so involved on the grassroots level, not because they're being paid, they're volunteering their time. In fact, um, Mike Collins' wife joked to me, at least I think she was joking, said, you know, um, during the winter, Mike spends more time volunteering on the hill and ski jumping than he does at his actual job. Um, but they do this because all of these years later, they're so passionate about their sport, but it also was modeled for them that this is what you do. You um, don't just take and take and take from your community. You give back. You pay it forward. It was done for them, and they are doing it for others. Last thing, reporters as a whole tend to be cynical, and I say that as a recovering journalist, as a recovering reporter, so I know. Um, as you're reporting this, as you're writing this, is there any part of you going, this is just too good to be true. This, this can't, there's got to be something else going on here in Norwich, or am I missing something? Right. Well, I think there are two things that mitigated that. Um, obviously, not everyone, there are helicopter mothers and fathers there, but of the, the, the last 10 Olympians produced by this town, there were none that I saw. But I grew up in Santa Clara in the 70s, and this was a time when Santa Clara was still agrarian. So it, in many ways, when I stepped foot in Vermont, I felt an instant connection that I could not explain because it reminded me so much of Santa Clara in the 70s. And I think I didn't feel cynical about it because this was the sort of support um, that I grew up with. I grew up among Olympians, being coached by Olympians, so it really normalized what is this extraordinary feat. It made you think, of course I can go to the Olympics someday. You know, my last three coaches have done that. Um, so for that reason, I was probably less cynical. And also, I first found out about this town in a reader email when I was at the Sochi Olympics, which I am not a cynical person by nature, but the last few Olympics could turn me into a cynic because Sochi was just a miserable experience. It was hard to not feel as if you were Putin stagecraft, that you could see all of this money that was being spent for what purposes, that a lot of these facilities were going to become instant white elephants after the Olympics were over. You could see that unrest that was... Um, 
you almost felt like after the last person left Sochi that war was going to break out across the border. Um, you saw athletes being pushed to do more and more daring feats at the expense of their well-being just to entertain the masses. It felt to me as someone whose whole life has been shaped by the Olympics that the purity of the Olympics, or what for me was the purity of purpose, we were so far beyond it that I wasn't sure it was recoverable. So this e reader email, I cannot thank the person enough for making me aware of this small town because it renewed my faith in the purity of purpose of the Olympic movement. Well, it's a terrific book. Uh, the book is Norwich. I highly recommend it. Uh, and Karen also has some, has some cards some, to pass out. It's out January 23rd, but here I have cards to pass out so that you don't forget. And you can pre-order at your <laughs> nearest, dearest independent bookstore or at Amazon.com. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to... Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks.